me off. And it doesn't even have to be sin. It can just be life. It could just be being tired. It could just be wanting to do other things. Amen. Believe it or not, I didn't always want to be a pastor. Amen. So sometimes I look at my life and I say, man, you know, if I took a couple years off from pastoring, maybe I could go back to school or, or you know, get a degree or just. And, and, and this chapter helps me, keeps me focused on what God wants me to do and what God has called me to do. And I hope that today, I entitled it Three Tough Questions, because they are three tough questions that we need to ask ourselves. But if we approach these questions with extreme honesty for ourselves, not out loud because no one needs to know your business, but for ourselves, these three questions have the capability to keep your life centered on what God wants you to do and what God has for you. And just as a Christian in general, it'll help keep you centered. I want to start with this story. In December of 1972, Flight 401 from Eastern Airlines ferociously collided with the Florida Everglades. This plane was a jumbo jet which marked the first crash of that size aircraft in America. Sadly, this crash killed 101 people this plane. 75 survived. But the crazy thing about this story is that this jumbo jet took off from Kennedy International Airport and only was on a two-hour flight to Miami. Within the first hour, as they got the black box to find out what happened, why this plane crashed, and to the investigators' horror, the whole story played out. And what took place is, as they were approaching for their final approach and coming to their landing, the pilots put the landing gear down. And in these planes, there was a little light that should start flashing, telling you that the landing gear successfully went down. Well, the little bulb, the little flash, the bulb went out on the light. And although they could physically see that the landing gear went down, nobody can explain why, but the captain and his first officer become fixated on the fact that the little light is not blinking. So the captain puts the plane into autopilot and says, this is a simple fix, me and you can knock this out in about two minutes. And they go about trying to fix this light. And while they're doing it, the rest of the crew, some of the stewardess came in, they unmanned certain posts, and they're all trying to fix this little light that's not blinking. One of the people turned the autopilot off by accident. And the officer that was supposed to be keeping his eye on the system that alerts you that you're losing altitude was also fixated on this light, so he didn't realize that the plane was lowering a thousand feet at a time. And because it was nighttime, they could not see outside the window. The plane crashed into the Everglades over a little bulb. And we can look at stories like this and say, man, this is crazy. A small little light. And, and they're trying to figure out why was the entire crew so focused on this light? But in our lives, we can start to stray and are in deadly uh, danger of crashing in our lives because we are fixated on things about Christianity that really have no relevance to your plane flying for Christ. And we can spend months, we can spend years of our life focused on these little minute details of serving God that we can ruin relationships we can ruin friendships, and we can be suffering in many other areas of our lives because our focus is on other things. In the book of Isaiah, God challenges his people in Judah. He's speaking through the prophet Isaiah here, and what's been happening is uh, the people of Judah are in captivity, and they're still serving God to an extent. They're still holding temple. They're still offering sacrifices. But their actions have completely, they're in other things. They're in sin, they're in rebellion towards God, they're worshiping other gods on the side, they're doing goofy things, but yet they're keeping up with all these rituals. They're making sure no matter what, 
I'm going to be at temple. No matter what, I'm going to do these feasts. No matter what, I'm going to be in church. It was like little blinking light that they were fixated on. And through the prophet Isaiah, God calls them here and tells them, you guys are in danger of crashing and you don't realize it. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 12, three tough questions. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon feast and your appointed feast. They have become a burden to me. Remember, Isaiah is speaking on behalf of God. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray here. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you have your way in this place, Lord. I pray that you increase as I decrease, God, that you get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in this place, Lord God, and you open the hearts and the minds of every believer in this room and all those who listen over the stream, God, and you speak to your children here in this place through me, Lord, for I am just a vessel, God, that is answering what you want me to do, God, and I pray that your words go before me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church says amen and amen. Three tough questions. And the first question is, why are you here? Why are you here? In verse 12, the Lord says, when you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? If you could put that verse up, I had it there, and leave it up there for a moment. So Isaiah starts by asking us a very important question, and it's really God. He's speaking on behalf of God. He says, God wants to know something, something personal, something that is confrontational, a question that can make us feel uncomfortable if we answer it honestly, but a question that if we are honest and truthful, can change our perspective, which then in turn will change our actions, which then will change our lives. God says, why are you here? And it's an individual question. And there's a lot of people who want to use this as a blanket and say, okay, well, well, why is the church here on earth? Why are Christians here on earth together? And why do we all come to church? What is the church for? And that's a cop-out. Because the church is made of a bunch of individuals that each have a personal relationship with God. We don't serve God collectively. We will all stand before God singly. Singular is the word, excuse me. By ourselves. So God says, you, you chose to come before me. He didn't make us be here tonight. He doesn't make us be Christians. He says, you chose to come before me. And then he also doubles down and says, so who requires of you this trampling? Who's forcing you to be here tonight? Me? My wife? God? Of course, we know the answer is no. But what makes this a tough question 
is that it's going to get down to the very essence. And this is what I believe when the Bible says that the word of God is like a two-edged sword that cuts all the way down to the bone and to the marrow. Why? Why do you go to church? Not just here at Lighthouse of Whiting. We've got people that go to a bunch of other churches that listen over the stream. The same question is presented to you. Why do you go to church? Fashion show? Friendship? To be critical? To feel better about yourself? Because you don't want to go to hell? Because you want to go to heaven? Why are you here? They did a survey in 2018, and they asked that very question of people. 81% of, of people said they go to church to become closer to God. 69% said so that their children will have some kind of moral foundation. 68% said to become a better person. 66 said because of they need comfort in times of trouble or sorrow. 59% said the sermons are good. 57% said they want to be a part of a community. 37% said to continue a family's religious tradition. 31% said they feel obligated to go. 19% said to meet new people or to socialize. 16% said just to please their family, spouse, or life partner. And that number to me seemed high. 81% of believers say that they are only in church to get closer to God. Because that's the, that's the default answer. We all know to say that. If somebody was to ask you out of the blue, why do you go to church? Well, I love God. I want to be closer to God. We say that, right? We say that's why we're here. But I wonder if this was like a truth serum. And God gave everybody a truth serum and said, why did you go to church today? What would the real answers be? Well, I didn't want to hear pastor's mouth because I didn't show up. But can we be honest? Because if every Christian, if even 80% of Christians say the only reason to come to church is to get closer to God, then why, why is the body of Christ so critical and hateful and hurtful against other believers? If your only reason for being here is to get closer to God, then why do we come and judge other people? Why do we come and treat other people bad? Why do we come and criticize songs and, and who's doing what and, and what this happened or that happened? If our only reason for being here is to get closer to God, then why do we come and do those things? I'm not just talking here and why. I'm talking about the church of Christ as a whole. Because if you try to say that church hurt is not happening, you're living in la-la land. I've met too many believers, too many that either don't go to church no more or are part of a church. And they all say the same thing. Oh, people in church are hypocrites. They just, they just talk about each other. They just do that. But I thought 81% are only here to get closer to God. This is what the religious Jews of Isaiah's time were doing. And they were trying to prove that through their actions. They say, I'm only here to get closer to God. I'm doing sacrifices. I'm here at all the events. I'm here at all the services. I'm here offering incense and praise and worship to God. I'm doing all those things, yet God still asks them, why are you here? And in our lives, our main focus can be what we do in church and not why we're in church to begin with. You got pastors behind the pulpit who can be ministers for 30, 40, 50 plus years and have no heart for people, have no heart for the things of God. It's just something they do. I've had people approach me and I'm not here to puff my head. I'm just telling you the God honest truth. There's people who've approached me with positions in other churches. This is not a career. I was called to the city of Whiting. I thought God called me here. Oh, I'm going to bounce around and see where I can get the best salary. Oh, if you don't think pastors are worried about salary, oh, man, you got to wake up. 
You got a lot of Christians who come to church. And they come, they sing, they could be in ministry, they could do different things, and they say, this is what I'm doing to God, this is why I'm in church, and they're so fixated on that. Who's doing what? Who's not doing what? Who's living like me? Who's not living like me? And God says, you're doing all this stuff, but why are you even here? Because the area that nobody sees, but God, God says, you're so far from me that if people would actually be able to see where you're at, nobody would listen to you. Nobody will respect you. But hey, we got to make sure that light's blinking. Got to make sure people see us check in. Got to make sure people see us there. Better come to prayer and act like I'm praying or people are going to be like, why'd you come to prayer? Better sing like I mean it, like my heart's really into it or, or people are going to ask me why I'm not singing. See, we're, we're trying to make sure that light is blinking. But spiritually, we're about to crash. Spiritually, we're going down. And this is what was happening to the Jewish people. And this is what happens even to me and sometimes in my life as a young pastor. That's why I said this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible that keeps me centered. I have to repeatedly ask myself, why am I here? Why? Just to build the biggest church in Whiting? Am I really in this? Is my heart really in this? The sobering truth to this is that the same God that loves us, the same God who has grace and mercy on us, abounding grace, and we'll get to that later in this chapter, is the same God who says, all your assemblies, I hate them. They become a burden to me. Did you catch that in the verses tonight? Look at how he, look, this is how God is describing their worship. He says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. What are some of the other things God said was an abomination? Come on now. The new moon and the Sabbath. These were both days that the Jewish people coveted and worshipped unto God, not unto a moon. They were worshiping God with these days, praising God for creation, having assemblies. Solemn assemblies were massive fast. Where the whole nation would fast. God says, you're fasting. You're going to church. You're praising me. You're fellowshipping. But yet, your heart and your actions of your true life are so far from me that all those things have become a burden to see. Have become a burden to watch. I don't know about you, but when I read scriptures like this, it shakes me to my core. Man, God. He says, when, because of this, I'm weary of bearing them. He says, I'm weary of even hearing your mouth. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen because your hands are covered in blood. See, so God said, with your mouth, you're praying, and you're asking, and you're seeking, and you're pleasing, but your hands, what you choose to grab, what you choose to touch, what you choose to work for, they're covered in blood. So your actions go before you further than your words. He says, I don't hear it. I won't listen. This is God saying this. I know you're looking for another translation. What's the message Bible say? <laughs> Matthew Henry puts it like this. When sinners are under the judgment of God, they will more easily be brought to fly with more devotions than to forsake their sins and reform their lives. There's plenty of Christians who are willing to pray. Plenty who are willing to give money. But how many are willing to say, man, this thing in my life, I need to forsake this sin. And reform means to change my life. Or do they just want to feel good? 
I know I'm living in sin. I know I'm treating God's people bad. I know that I'm doing these things. You want to know what one of my pet peeves is? Is when I meet people and they act like they don't know what they're doing. Well, I didn't mean it like that. Come on, man, you know what you meant. We all know what we're trying to say. You can do those things and then bring, remember he said, you bring yourself to my courts and then bring yourself into the house of God and do this and do this and do this. And God says, your hands are covered in blood. Your hands are covered in blood, how you're living your life. See, our relationship with God should lead us to truly know him. In that knowledge of who God is, we should strive to live how he desires. You know what we do? We make it about a church. Oh, that's just the way Lighthouse believes. No, that's what the Bible says. How can you, how can you say you're a child of God and don't want to live how God desires? Got some more scriptures for you. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, 3. This is how the chapter starts off. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth. So first he says, in front of all of heaven as a witness, God's saying these things. For the Lord speaks, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel not, does not know. My people do not understand. God says, even an animal knows who their master is. Anybody here have pets? Even pets know who their master is. They know who feeds them. They know who puts food in the bowl, who brings water, who gives them good things, who disciplines them. That's why it's called training an animal. God says even a basic animal can understand this, yet my own people don't even know who I am or what I require from their life. They don't understand. They don't even know me. My own people. James chapter 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves. Notice that word, prove. He doesn't say just make sure everybody trusts and believes that you're doing these things. He says prove it. Live it out. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Other translations say who lie to themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person that he is. So God says, when you look at my word about your life, the word of God is a mirror. Tells you what you're doing and what you should be doing. He says, those who read it and know it and don't live it, are like somebody who can look in the mirror and see that they're all tore up, see they got a big booger hanging out of their nose, and walk away and forget that they even seen it. Who could do that? I know some women can't do that. Amen? And women take a long time getting dressed. Why? They want to make sure everything looks right. You're looking in the mirror. Imagine if you looked in the mirror, you saw all these jacked up things, and you just walk outside. No, you'll be like, oh, man, let me fix myself up. I look crazy. We all know that concept. God says, this is how you're doing it. You're looking at my word. You know what my word says. You're a hearer of it, but you don't do it. So you're only lying to yourself. Some of us don't need the devil to lie to us. We're lying to ourselves. We do a good enough job of it on our own. Why are you here tonight? Honestly, why do you go to church? See, that's why it's a tough question. Because in God's eyes, if you're here to do anything else besides give him glory and to love his people and to love him, anything else is just worthless garbage. Everything else it's just senseless things that different churches do. Did you ever wonder why the Bible never puts set things for how churches should run? Because every church is different. But you know what people do? We get so hung up on how our church does it that we can be more worried about that when judging other people's lives than we can if they're even trying to serve God or if they're going to church for the right reason. 
traditions of men. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. My problem with you is not your traditions. It's you started to teach your traditions as doctrine. And that's where you're erroring. That's where your problem is. The little light is blinking. Better make sure I got three services, though. Better make sure I don't preach longer than 45 minutes. Better make sure we sing two songs on the midweek, three songs on Sunday. Better make sure we pick up the prayer request. Oh, we're making sure that light is blinking. But spiritually, we're just. And even me, as a young man, as a young pastor, I have to ask myself this probably more times than I do. Why am I here? Why? Because if it truly is to just be closer to God, then the next question's even tougher than the first. Are you learning? If you're here to get closer to God, then are you learning? I'll explain that in a minute. You don't go look at where it happened, said Scott Goodyear, who started 33rd in the Indianapolis 500. They were asking him about crashes. What do you think about crashes in this race? You don't watch the films or even look at it on television. You don't deal with it. What you do is you pretend like it never happened. The Indianapolis Speedway encourages this approach. As soon as any race ends for the day, any accident, the crew heads out and paints over immediately where the car hit the wall. Through the years, a driver has never been pronounced dead at the racetrack out loud, even though some have died at these races. They don't announce it. And even in the racing museum for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, located inside the 2.5 mile oval, there is no memorial for the over 40 drivers who have lost their lives in that race. They won't even mention their names. Many Christians learn to live this way. Instead of addressing the issues in our life, we pretend like they're not there. Pretend like they don't exist. Oh, the big ones that everybody sees, we make sure we got those in order. Oh, I don't want to be drinking in front of people, acting a fool in front of people, smoking dope in front of people, whatever your lifestyle is. The big ones we make sure nobody can see. Oh, man, but the major deep character issues of our life, oh, we pretend like it's not even there. Just ignore it. Don't even whisper the name. Don't even say it. And this is the main catalyst for why believers are stunted in growth. Because they never want to bring these things to light. They never want to work on these things. They stop growing. They stop learning as a believer. And the hard ones are the ones we don't want to share. And anybody who is open, instead of being the church that's supposed to be there to help people through it, what do we do? Oh, can you believe that they just came out outright and said that that's what they like to do when no one's watching? Like, oh, man, that guy, he really needs Jesus. Oh, that girl, she ain't for real about God. All the while, our plane is crashing in here. But let's make sure nobody knows. Let's make sure nobody sees. We've stopped learning years ago. We stopped learning for our own lives. And you know what we do pick up? Theological questions. You know, they say at 35, men, you're either going to get into smoking meat, right, on the grill, or you're going to get real deep into World War II history. This is just a running joke for guys in the middle part of their lives. Midlife crisis, something serious going on on the inside, but then we play games and we try to mask it by other things going on. Spiritually, we can be in a crisis mode, but we'll mask it. We'll hide it. Oh, because God forbid anybody knows that you're struggling. God forbid that. 
No, everybody needs to think you're perfect. Don't want people to know I need prayer. Don't want people to know that sometimes I question God. Let me just keep up appearances. You ever meet a couple that you know the, the, the problems in their relationship, yet on Facebook they're just keeping up appearances? And on the internet it looks like their marriage is completely perfect? And you're like, man, I know what's going on. They're, they'd be going off on each other every day. I know the real story. But that's how a lot of Christians are. We stop learning. And we stop growing. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. This is the later on in this text. Look what God is saying here. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. This is the next phrase from where I get the question, are you still learning? Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That shows us that as God's people, we're not perfect. We have to continue to learn how to do good. We got to continue to learn how to get these things in our life fixed by the power of God. Not continue to do evil. No, cease doing evil and learn to do good. See, we have fellowship with God now, and that's what exposes the darkness in your life, in my life. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and with God. That's what they're talking about there. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Does that mean you're perfect? No. Let's continue reading. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is always learning. If you have stopped confessing, you have stopped learning and you have stopped growing. God says, we sin. But because we have fellowship with the light, we cannot just leave it there. We have to confess these things. We can't continue to just be walking in darkness, living our lives as if it's not there. No, we have to keep learning. We have to keep growing. One day we'll be free from this sinful nature, but that's not today. The Christians who come to church and act like they don't sin, you're a walking a thing of that scripture. He says, how can you act like that? How can you behave as if you're not doing nothing wrong? The word of God is not in you. I've been saved for eight years. I know a tremendous amount about God's word. I've studied more in the last year and a half than I've studied in my entire life. And I'm still learning every day. Junior, here's a new truth for you. Here's a new thing to bring you closer to me. The way that you responded to that young girl where you kind of had a short attitude with her. That's not right, Junior. You can't talk to people like that. Man, the way that you were over here acting like this, you can't act like that, Junior. I'm still learning every day. God, forgive me the day I stand behind this pulpit and I act like I'm so holy that I'm looking down spiritually on everybody and not just physically here because it's raised up. God, help me if I ever get to that point. Because then I stopped growing. I stopped learning. And God's asking them, learn to do good. See, as darkness is exposed, the need turns darkness into something that needs to be corrected and removed. Conviction, confession, reconciliation, right? Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? 
Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Paul is telling the Romans here, just because we have grace doesn't mean that you just continue to live in sin. No, the knowledge that we were baptized with Jesus in death, the death he did on the cross for our sin should never, ever allow us to get comfortable with the problems that we have in our lives. We might not be perfect. We might still slip up. We might still partake in them. But God never let us just get comfortable doing those things because Jesus died for those very things that we're okay just doing. It's like a spouse who keeps cheating on you, but then keeps telling you that they love you. At what point do you say, man, if you really love me, you stop cheating? He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that God gives us more grace? No, that's not the mindset to have. We thank God for his grace, but let us never grow so comfortable with sin that we don't even think anymore that that's the very thing that Jesus died for. We should always learn, not just know, but start learning to change. Last scripture on this question, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Remember, it's all up here. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Many people stop there. Say, Pastor, I'm just living on God's grace. I've been messing up. I've been acting a fool. I know it's wrong. I'm going to keep doing it because I got God's grace. But the scripture does not stop right there. It continues in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Notice how he phrased our past lives. Those were the things you loved to do when you were ignorant, but you're not ignorant anymore. Now you know. So then it goes on. Look at verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He says, you were ignorant to these things. At one time, you didn't know that you were doing wrong or you didn't care. You were ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean stupid like nobody taught you. It just means you were ignorant, didn't care, wasn't worried about it, didn't care about the things you were doing. But we're not ignorant anymore. We're learning. We're knowing how God wants us to live, how God wants us to act. And with that knowledge comes accountability, church. This is why I preach and I tell you guys, stop saying these things over your life. This is just the way I'm always going to be. Man, you're just speaking garbage on yourself. We got to learn. If we all took that mentality, then how could we help anybody? If I took that mindset that this is just the way I'm always going to be, how could I be preaching here today? I still be drinking and smoking dope. I still be out on the streets, game banging. Telling you, oh, I got the blood of Jesus in me, God's grace, covering all my sins. Thank God for my sins. Matter of fact, up your wallet. Don't worry, God's going to forgive me for this. Let me get it off. But see, we know it sounds crazy with those sins, but because our lives are not in those sins, we make allowances for the things that we continue to do. Oh, you could be in lust. You can be in drama. Oh, but I get it. God gave you that. God gave you a test. God gave you a trial. No, God didn't give you no sin. You love it. And you're growing comfortable with it. And that's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be, to be comfortable in sin. Do you want to learn? He said, those are your former lusts. Remember, lust is not always talking about sexual perversion. 
If the word lust means to crave something, he said, those were your former things that you went after. If it was business and all you cared about was money, you didn't care about people, and you just worked your life away, and you lost your family, and you, you were just disrespectful, you went after those things. He said, but you were ignorant. You're not ignorant anymore. You're accountable, brother and sister. And this is why I'm telling you out of love. You're accountable. You can't keep saying, oh, I just lose my temper. That's why I go off on people. You got to learn to get rid of that because you're accountable to what you know. Here's a little hint. You don't want any more accountability? Stop reading the Bible then. Because <laughs> the minute you start reading, God says, you know now. You're accountable. This is why he says some of you should not be teachers at all. Because now, not only do you say you read and you know, but now you're saying that you're explaining it to others so they know. And God says that comes with an even heavier level of responsibility. Because not only did you, did you read it for yourself, but then you got behind my pulpit, then you got behind a, a Bible study stand, then you have people that you're teaching, and now you're saying you're teaching it to somebody else. God says, you're even under another heavier accountability. So some of you should not be teachers. That's why he was telling the church in Corinth. Some of you shouldn't be doing that thing because you can't even stay accountable to the very thing that you know. But now you're trying to lead others into accountability. Man, that's such a dangerous place to be. If you're having a hard time with accountability in your life, one thing you need to stop doing today is stop trying to make other people accountable. Because God says, man, now you're trying to put those things on my children? When you're living like that, oh, no, now, now God looks down and says, no, 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 I ain't got time for that nonsense. And there's a lot of believers who live that way. Oh, the standards for other people are up here. No, pastor, they should know. He should know. She should know. All the while, you're not even being living accountable to the things you know. Told you it was going to be tough questions to ask ourselves. Are you still learning? And lastly, the last question, I don't got much time here. Do you really want to work with God? And I mean that with all seriousness. Do you really want to work with God? This is what I love about this chapter. And this is why it will always be special to me to the day I die. Look how God finishes off very, very tough things that God says to his people. And then he ends with this. Look at verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. The God of heaven and earth says, let us reason together. Let us work together. Let us figure this out. Okay, you're in nonsense. Okay, you're in sin. Okay, you've been acting a fool. Okay, I'm sick and tired of all your little worthless offerings and, and you've been coming to church, but you're not really serving me. And God doesn't stop there. He says, now, now that we got all the questions answered, do you really want to work with me? If you do, then let's work this out together. I don't know if that doesn't blow your mind or not, but it does for me. God's willing to work things out with me? Come, let us reason together. Come now. An invitation to, to reconcile ourselves back with God and what God wants for us in God's plan. You know, it's pure madness to reject and to resist God. It's madness. It's insanity. And that's why without God, we live the same merry-go-round of a life. Because if we're honest, we haven't been coming to church for the right reasons. If we're honest, we stopped learning a long time ago. So God's screaming to us, here's our merry-go-round of life, the same issues. We do good for a little bit, come back down, and we're back in the same major failure. Do good in a little bit, back on the mountaintop, boom, back in the valley. Do good for a little bit, back with the same attitude. Do good for a little bit, back with the same doubts. You know why we're living that life? Because we stopped learning. We stopped coming to God for the right reasons. And all the while, God is screaming out to us, come and reason with me. 
let's work this out, son, daughter. Let's get you to the new place. I have direction for you. I have love for you. I have purpose for you. It can be so much better than what you're doing now, but you got to come. You got to get off of the ride, and you have to come to God. Notice his first response is grace. It's human beings. We, we have a tendency to always focus on the negative, which is why people are fixated on hell and fixated on the devil. But if you read God's word, you'll understand that his first response to sin was not hell. It's grace. It's reconciliation. It's love. He even says hell was not created for you. It was created for the devil and his angels. He always had a better way for us. It's us. We're the ones who stay on this crazy ride of life, choosing our own direction, choosing our own path. And God could be screaming, come reason with me. Let me help you. Your sins are like scarlet. They will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white wool. Like, man, God says, look at all the power to cleanse your life, to change you, son, daughter. Get off the ride and come to me. One of the greatness, greatest things God offers, cleansing and pardon. Come. Come now. God wants all separation between you and him to be gone. He doesn't want you to continue on that destructive path in your life. He says, come now. Reason with me. Let me make it white as snow. Though it's red like crimson. He's talking about your current condition. Though it's jacked up, come. Come. And I got a better way for you. Didn't say easier, but I have a better way for you. So are you willing to reason and work with God? Really work with God. And say, I got to let these things go. I got to be honest with myself. I'm the one staying here. It's not God has me living like that. I'm choosing to stay this way. That's a tough question to answer for ourselves. Oh, no, God, this is not the devil. This is not a principality. This is not some demon with some forked tongue poking me in the rear end in the middle of the night. I'm choosing to live this way. Do you really want to work with God? Because then God says in verse 19, if. Notice it says if because it's our choice. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. And he's speaking to the people in Judah so the enemies were around them. And God says the very thing that you're trying to overcome, it'll devour you because you refuse and you rebel against what I'm telling you to do. So here's the last question to ask yourself. The fourth hard question. Are you willing to consent, be obedient, and obey? Or do you want to continue to refuse and rebel? The choice is yours. And the freedom that this has offered me as a preacher 